You're listening to the Autism Weekly Podcast. Each week, we share community voices and bring light to stories that increase awareness, acceptance, equity, access, and inclusion. If you haven't already, subscribe to join the Autism Weekly family. I'm your host, Jeff Skibitsky. This week, we are joined by not one, but two special guests. First up, we have Dr. David Cox, VP of Data Science for Rethink. With over 45 peer-reviewed articles and three books under his belt, Dr. Cox has dedicated his career to finding innovative ways to optimize behavioral health outcomes and clinical decision-making. We're also thrilled to welcome Jamie Pagliaro, co-founder and head of behavioral health at Rethink. With an impressive background working directly with individuals with disabilities across a variety of home and school settings, Mr. Pagliaro has authored numerous articles on the use of technology and special education. Together, they bring a wealth of knowledge and expertise to our discussion on the potential value of AI data analytics in the future of autism care. Welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks, Jeff. It's awesome to be here. Appreciate you uh, asking us on. Yeah, you know, it's my pleasure. And, and I think that a lot of our guests probably have an understanding of what Rethink is, but it's nice to give a little bit of a backdrop. And Jamie, maybe you can just give us the, the global picture of what Rethink is and what they offer to the autism community. Yeah, thanks, Jeff, for having me back on your podcast. It's always, always fun to hang out with you and have a conversation. But uh, we started Rethink uh, about 15 years ago now with the idea that we could leverage technology uh, to disseminate best practices for individuals with autism and behavioral needs. Um, and I don't think any of us 15 years ago ever could have imagined all the different places we'd expand into. So initially, we we focused on supporting school districts and their special education program. And today, our, our Rethink Ed platform supports thousands of school programs throughout the U.S. with not only autism, but also getting into social emotional learning and mental health prevention, which are, are huge topics, as you well know, in our public school systems today. We also have digital solutions to help parents of children with special needs, uh, which we uh, provide through our employee benefits program, uh, Rethink Care. Um, and that's allowed us to reach employees around the world, really, and support them not only with personalized uh, digital tools, but also with access to a team of board certified behavior analysts where they can receive parent coaching. Um, of course, uh, many folks in the, the autism ABA world know us for our Rethink Behavioral Health platform, where we provide an electronic medical record, practice management, and revenue cycle management, uh, both software and services to uh, providers that are typically working with health plans. Um, and then our, our most recent expansion into developing tools to also help payers uh, improve the quality and rigor with which they're uh, authorizing and overseeing services for uh, children with autism receiving ABA. Um, and we really see an amazing opportunity to um, really support all of these stakeholders and bring more objectivity and more science into how we provide care. And ultimately, our goal through data science is to see how we can go beyond just being a, a container for data and a content delivery system to actually providing insights to all these stakeholders so that they can improve what they're doing for, for the folks that they're serving. I love that mission. And, and the value behind it is uh, it's immeasurable. The, I, so I've, I've seen your growth over the years and kind of how you've taken on different challenges. And you all have, a, have always been future thinking as far as, you know, how do we continue to progress things? The ability to take all the data that you all have seems like it is one of the cornerstones of behavioral health in general is how do you take data to make better decision making? But it, the use of AI in this is relatively new. So I guess, that, I mean, just in broad strokes, what sparked your interest in AI for the autism field? Because that isn't something that we had seen before. Um, and, and you all are starting to put it out there. Yeah, I mean, first of all, it's a game changer. And I think it's it's one of the, uh, the most game changing technology advancements that is is real. It's now. And I know a lot of people in, in healthcare and behavioral health are talking about the potential of AI. And I'm, I'm really proud to say that uh, with folks like David joining our team, that we're not just talking about it, we're actually doing it now. And, and I guess in simple terms, 
you know, our, our tools were always set up to help behavior analysts capture data and look at data for individual clients and make clinical decisions. Uh, where AI becomes a game changer, I know when we started the company 15 years ago, we would sit around and we'd talk about somebody could dig into the basements of some of these organizations that were doing great research at the time on a very small scale. And we could get all those program binders that all the data was recorded with pencil and paper on graph. Somebody could take all that and analyze it. We'd probably learn a lot about what was going on with kids and how to improve care. Um, AI, you know, as we've now, you know, been collecting data across these different stakeholders and accumulating our data set for 15 years, gives this incredible opportunity to do exactly that. But A, it's able to do it on a massive scale that would be pretty difficult for humans to do. And B, it's able to start identifying things in the data that the human may not know to ask or even look for. And, and even previous big data science projects tended to be driven by a human hypothesis going in and looking for things to prove or disprove what they think was going on. AI sort of just blows that all out of the water and starts to look at things that we might not have even thought to ask the data. Um, and I'll, I'll turn it over to, to David to maybe share some of his, um, you know, interest in this area and, and what brought him to, uh, to, to collaborate. Oh, yeah. Sure, yeah, thanks, Jamie. Oh yeah, did you have a question, Jeff? No, I, I, I was just going to ask is, I mean, your your background is a lot of uh, data science. It's It's been okay. that way to try and improve quality of care, access to care, efficiencies in care. So tell me a little bit about, you know, how you took that passion and where that came from. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so it really started back when I was a BCBA and I had a caseload um, doing all, all, the, all the work that goes on with that. And within that, what I started to notice was that you'd have the same same kit, same profile, same assessment scores, and two different BCBAs would come up with different decisions in terms of how much ABA they needed, what programs need to be worked on, what was the most priority based on the setting they're in. Um, and, and really, at the end of the day, each of those BCBAs had different kind of training, educational histories, and it was hard to say one was right and the other was wrong. So that really got me interested in just clinician decision making generally, how to how does that happen? Um, how can we measure it? What does that look like? Um, and that's kind of when I pivoted from clinical work to academic research. And at that same time, I also contacted uh, kind of two uh, new reports that had, had come out around the errors in clinical decision making. So one was um, this, the, the popular one is 2016, a report with physicians suggesting that medical errors were the third leading cause of death in the United States, right? More dangerous than bungee jumping and, and skydiving. Um, and then the second was the, some, some data out of the judicial process suggesting that the time of day that a judge makes a decision can impact whether they find you guilty and the length of the, the sentence. Or if you catch them right before lunch, that's not a great spot. If you can catch them right after lunch, you're, you're sitting, sitting better. Um, so this got me around this idea of, you know, not just clinical decision making, but how can we start to measure and identify errors in clinical decisions and then help people make better decisions? Um, Within that literature, when I started to dive in, um, that's where machine learning and AI was really coming of age in, in healthcare. And I started to see time and time again, this technology, this process that was better at making decisions than humans in a lot of capacities, or at minimum was providing kind of what, uh, what Jamie had alluded to, insights, things that clinicians weren't seeing, or they could do it faster, more efficient, think of more variables. Um, that's where, where I really got interested in AI and its intersection with clinical decision-making um, that's about 10 years ago, and I just really haven't looked back. So. so what's the, what? and maybe you'll have to walk me through this, because I'm I'm not as educated on this as you are, but I look at, at what maybe my wife had done back when she was in schooling. So she's a physician, but she did a master's in public health and epidemiology, which is and, looking at population health data and looking at, okay, so how do we tailor recommendations in the medical world to that? Is AI looking at that at almost more of a granular level and taking even more data, but constantly processing it to kind of give us more individualized, fine-tuned answers to the population health questions? I mean, is that, yeah. or am I off in my thought process? Yeah, no, no, I think you're right on track. Um, and where where AI, I think, has, has benefits, um, kind of to your point, we can consider more variables, do it more efficiently, and, and we could do this in an ongoing manner. It doesn't take a human waking up and reanalyzing the data every day. Um, and then the second kind of coupled with that is we just have so much more data on people 
um, wearable technology, how they're walking and moving around their environment, the internet, all these things. Um, that if you look at epidemiological studies two decades ago, three decades ago, um, there were just fewer things to analyze. Now we have hundreds, thousands, maybe millions of variables we can look at. And so then the question becomes, how do you efficiently parse through that to answer those very similar, very similar questions? Okay. And so, Jamie, when when we were uh, kind of looking at the field in general, and, and we've had conversations on this on, uh, historically, just as the growth in the field, the knowledge set changing, um, the, the youth in career, not youth in age, but in career for the field, it's we're putting a lot of pressure on people to make decisions and to be leaders very young in their career without an abundance of guidance. So where does AI fit in helping to support people in their decision-making process as they're developing all of their clinical knowledge set and all of their experiential pieces going forward? Well, I, I think it starts with, you know, what, what uh, I've heard health plans refer to as the front door, which is when a child is first identified and they come in contact with a provider who is going to do an initial assessment and make a recommendation about the dosage of ABA, the number of treatment hours that a child is going to receive. And obviously, you know, there's a there's a broad range there from somebody providing a few hours a week all the way through to, you know, early intensive behavioral intervention programs that are, you know, 40 hours a week of one-on-one -on -one, uh, therapy. So, you take someone who hasn't necessarily been trained in this concept of prescribing dosage of hours, and you combine that with a, a literature set that doesn't necessarily have a clear guideline for how to do that, um, and you create what I would see as the Wild West, and, mm -hmm. and you know one that now becomes colored by you know, what my professional opinion is or what my training with the, the, the clients I've worked with in the past, or maybe even economic agenda of, you know, I, I provide parent training only, or we only serve kids with intensive programs in a clinic. And then you've got the other side of that as a health plan that's saying, oh my gosh, these, these um, you know, requests are coming in. They're very varied. There's no, there's no pattern. And to David's point earlier, one clinician could even see the same uh, patient and come up with different recommendations. Um, so now you say, are there economic drivers there to say, well, gee, let's let's not, you know, authorize too much service here. Let's push back and and come up with a case. Why not to provide the service? And so, you know, I see huge opportunity to start right there with figuring out what is the appropriate level of care. And instead of making it one that's colored by, you know, two professionals and their their background experience or the economic agendas of the, the organizations that you're working with. Can you bring clarity and can something like AI help us analyze the results that are able to be achieved with a client or patient and compare that to uh, other patients that are similar? And, and that's where it gets tricky too, right? Because with autism, we know it's a, a broad spectrum. So it's not a one size fits all. They can say he's, he's this age and this is what he should get or you know, in the early days of my career, you know, people used mild, moderate and severe autism. And, you know, we found that that was a very limiting way to classify kids into one of those three buckets. Um, AI just opens up this tremendous opportunity to help with this idea of clustering patients or creating patient cohorts and figuring out what is that right level of, of ABA that's gonna help get the optimal treatment effect. So I think that's one example of where we can help drive insights to someone that you know may not have the training or knowledge to make that decision. And potentially we can do it in a more systematic way and a more scientific way. Now, I love the fact that you're bringing alignment around the right ideas too. It's, it's around the patient care. So you're taking a payer viewpoint a practitioner viewpoint, and you're centering it around what's going to be the best prognosis for that patient and kind of what their goals are and what their life expect as, as far as what they're hoping to be able to get out of life, how they how they look to be able to contribute. Um, and I think that all of those are important factors. Um, so I, 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 I love the fact that there's two angles that you're looking at this. So what are those big buckets? So that we're as an industry that we're needing to normalize. One of them might be dosage. I think, David, you had mentioned priority, but what are those data sets that you're 
currently grabbing, David, that that are helping to guide us on, you know, this is the right treatment path. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think one of them goes into, which, which Jamie has alluded to, this kind of idea of patient profiling, creating patient cohorts. Because, you know, we have all, all this information about somebody, who, they're, uh, who they are, where they're from, uh, diagnostic categories, skill assessments, also the, the family they live in, the zip code they live in, social determinants of health, all that fun stuff. Um, from that, we can start to identify, you know, what makes this person unique? And I think that that's a really interesting challenge in and of itself, going back to this idea of a spectrum, autism spectrum. Um, what, what does that mean? And it's probably not just two-dimensional, right, but multi-dimensional. Um, the second, going back in particular for like predicting dosage and stuff, but also in informing care comes around this question of what is a, a dose of ABA? Um, we often talk about like, you know, an hour, that's what often is put out in the literature, but what goes into that? You know, what is rate of trial presentation? Um, how does it play? How do you kind of intermix goals um, or, inter, or inter, intersperse them? How does that relate back to VB map scores or whatever? Um, and so I think that's another really interesting um, uh, tool or, or analytic approach that we can go after is better quantifying what do I mean by an hour of ABA, a dose of ABA therapy? And then another thing that we're also starting to kind of look at is you can do that same idea of patient profiling, but with providers. Um, we all have di unique experiences. I might be better with some individuals than, than you and, and, you know, the third BCBA. So you can start kind of combining this interesting kind of set of what exactly, um, how can we characterize or define a client or a patient? How can you identify who a provider is really good at working at and what does ABA therapy actually look like? And when we bring these three things together, you can start then making recommendations around um, various combinations of that. How do I get to optimal progress or better progress? Um, yeah. yeah, it's really fascinating the opportunities that come off of even just those three things. I would never have thought about the specialization within ABA being something yeah. that could be driven by AI, but it makes sense is that you're managing employees at the same time and you're going to see their strengths. You're going to see where they're focusing better and where they're improving. So it's almost that third layer of you have the ability to be able to provide better patient care. You have the ability to be able to get alignment with with payers on, you know, this is the this is the expectation of care. But I think that as a management team, you probably also have a way to be able to better utilize your your staff Absolutely. and your clinicians. Um, and that's that's a part I would never have thought of uh, as far as the value of what AI could provide. Um, so one of the issues that I see often is that within our field is that we're not communicating the potential path of treatment or the barriers to treatment, or oh, yeah. um, I don't want to use the, the term prognosis, but people ask for what's the, what's the prognosis? How long am I going to be there? And uh, what, what should I expect? Does this open up those communication trends? And maybe Jamie, you've been in the front line of trying to understand, you know, the autism community and, and what their needs are as far as understanding treatment. Does this create better dialogue? Uh, I, I think it does, and I think it points us in that direction. I think the technology or the application of this technology to the type of data that we have is still in its early stages, that I, I would be cautious about saying we can give you a long-term prognosis. Um, and, and we might get there, right? I mean, that that's where the, the more information we have and the longer we can track um, you know, a, a progression, the better. I know, for example, we, we're doing a lot of work with our uh, AI system on data that's collected in EMR, and that doesn't necessarily tell us what happens when the child leaves treatment service and is, and is no longer tracked by that provider. So there's clearly going to be some, some gaps in the data um, that might preclude us from having a real long-term view at this stage. Um, what I do think it does is help us talk in shorter increments. I mean, I think we're all familiar with the, the concept that a health plan authorizes services typically in six-month chunks. And I think what the AI system that David and the team have worked on can help us do is, is, first of all, have more informed conversations with parents and with funders about what is optimal for that that period of treatment and, and why we think that's optimal for that particular patient and to have some understanding of what kinds of things should be prioritized and worked on during that time and what we think we can accomplish within that period of time so you know i, I look at you know this this whole world of things that we might 
teach or skill deficits that we might address in an ABA program. I know with, with Rethink's platform, we've got, you know, hundreds of protocols that you can pull from. Some of them are, are sort of recommended by using tools like the VB map, but ultimately it's up to that clinician to, to develop a treatment plan and say, here's what we're gonna work on for that six month period. If we can better inform that clinician and say, I know you want to put these six things in, but actually if you pulled this other thing from the communication domain into the plan, that might have a better chance of being successful in the next six months and might give you a better result. I think that's the kind of thing that we can really start to inform care. And maybe it's not a long-term prognosis, but it can help us set some expectations in shorter increments of time when, when active treatment's being delivered. Yeah, and I mean, so I guess this brings about the question is when uh, Rethink had the MNA, the Medical Necessity Advisory Tool, it, it was it was a tool. So it was part of a decision making process. It wasn't the be all end all. This is exactly what you have to do. So I'm almost thinking that the AI piece is going to be the same thing. It gives you a starting point. It gives you the framework to start thinking through through those processes. And then when you have things that you are as a clinician saying, you know, I look at the, the culture of this family. I look at the, the ecology of what's happening in their life right now. I look at their lived experience. I make modifications to individualize. Does that help to, and, and maybe I'll ask you, David, because you're so heavy into the, into the data science part, but does that help to kind of take away any of the ethical concerns that would occur with AI where you're almost living just by the numbers by using oh, it yeah. as a component tool? Yeah. Oh, I, I agree 100%. Um, and, and I think one thing that, that might help people better understand what these systems do is they're phenomenal at identifying patterns within the data that we have. So exactly to your point, to the extent that there are characteristics or things going on in someone's life that we don't have data on one, let alone we have enough data on that we can actually work it into the system, it necessarily won't be including that information. Um, it doesn't just kind of know everything. Um, so a lot of these tools, they, they can't see everything. They don't have data on everything. So exactly to your point, these can serve up recommendations, insights, things that people may not have thought of that should be used in conjunction with the individual's clinical expertise, things that they're seeing. Um, it's referred to as the human in the loop in, in artificial intelligence especially in healthcare, there's always a, a human in the loop. Um, and in some states, it's legally mandated. You can't automate this stuff, so. Yeah, and I think that, I mean, by by having the advantage of getting the data up front that gives you a general framework, I think that just helps to guide. And especially as a clinician that might be still early in their career or even late in their career, and there's new kind of science that's out there that you just can't keep up on everything is having Absolutely. something that's giving you and feeding you some of that information from the beginning has got to be extremely helpful in your treatment planning process. So, it's, I mean, as you look through this and as you start to kind of identify some of the, the things that you're already able to do, which might be giving some guidance on dosage, being able to kind of look at, you know, maybe the number of objectives that might be more optimal for different kind of uh, categories of pay, of clients. Um, what what are the things that you're hoping you might be able to get to in the future that maybe aren't there yet that we can start to maybe have our fingers crossed that, you know, we might get even more knowledge out of this system? Yeah, uh, I'll take a first crack. And then, uh, David, I'd love to hear you expand on this one too. But I, I just think we can keep digging deeper and deeper. And I, I keep telling people, you know, some of the initial work that we've done with our data set is, is still really the tip of the iceberg. So if let's say we can predict based on a child's profile, based on the number of hours of service they receive, we can predict approximately how well they'll do with a treatment plan and progressing through goals. And then potentially identify patients that maybe aren't progressing as expected, that's a that's a great step in the right direction that we say, hey, clinical director or BCBA, you should be taking a closer look at this case because he or she is not progressing as we would expect. And, and maybe there's human elements that are outside of our data set that, that we're not seeing that the human can lay eyes on. 
but there's also, I think, a wealth of information underneath the data that we can dig deeper into. For example, can we analyze that maybe the child responds better with some therapists versus others? Can we look at some goals that maybe they haven't run a sufficient number of treatment trials? Do we have a patient where maybe there's a lot of parent cancellations or the agency has had trouble scheduling sessions because they don't have staff? If we can actually start digging under the hood and say insight is that maybe this child isn't doing what we expect, but now we can actually start surfacing more actionable things for the family, the, the provider, the payer that, that they could actually pivot or change what they're doing along the way to get that child back on track. That would be my my hope and, and where I'd like to see us evolve, even if we could get that down to in the moment that a therapist is on a mobile app collecting data, get to a point that we can actually say something during that session that might say, you want to modify the reinforcer you're using or the prompting that you're using um, or switch tasks at this moment. I mean, to me, that's where it really gets actionable in the moment as a therapist delivering treatment. I don't know, David, you know, if you've got some additional thoughts on that one, because that's that's an exciting conversation. So yeah, what are your thoughts? Oh, yeah. Mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I think um, going back to how I originally got into the clinical decision making, that that exact kind of in the moment feedback on optimizing decision making, I think, is what has really been kind of driving me this uh, over the last um, you know, 16, 17 years. Um, an, another area, I think, on top of that, that I get really excited thinking about uh, is comes from uh, protein folding and drug discovery research in AI. And what's been fascinating there is that they've been using AI to come up with kind of novel ways of folding proteins, and they're coming up with solutions to, um, to treating disease and disorders, things like that, that the scientists don't know how they work. They, they didn't foresee this thing being discovered, but it's effective. And it's like those unknown unknowns. And that's also where I get excited. You know, as we dig into this, what kind of interesting things are we going to find that we say like, hey, this is going to be effective for this kid? And it is. And then we have to figure out why is that effective? You know, and you can do the, the hard science after that, too. But, um, you know, in the moment, kind of optimizing decision making and unknown unknowns, I think, are the two things I get excited about in the future. Yeah, I mean, with the amount of data that you all are able to collect right now, I would imagine is that getting some of these trends, some of these patterns becomes more and more readily available. Um, even even in the, the current process, and I want to get back to the, the relationship with payers, is that Oftentimes I, I hear the frustration on the payer side is that, you know, you have programs where it's very consistently saying everybody who comes into our program has to get this number of hours. It's not individualized. There's no real process to it. On the other hand, they have it where it's totally subjective to, you know, well, this patient could get five hours and there's no rationale behind it. And then the same patient the kind of uh, characteristics might be 25 hours by somebody else. What is your current feedback from the payer on, you know, we're getting some more global individualization. You're getting some better big picture focus so that you're not getting programs that are just being consistent to this is my model, but more consistent to this is the benefit for the patient. Do you, yeah, do, you have, I, do you have your I, feedback? I mean, you've been in you've been in those conversations. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, again, you know, our interest sitting sort of outside of the provider payer dynamic is not necessarily advancing a model or a program, but it's really trying to get down to really a more scientific determination of what is clinically appropriate for an individual child. And one of the most powerful things of, of the data set that we have is that, you know, we're covering such a broad range of, you know, everything from the providers that utilize our software to the geographies where services are being provided, the different funders that are funding those services, social determinants of health that are mixed in there. It's, it's allowing us to say that, yes, every child is different. But when you start to look at tens and hundreds of thousands of patients, you can start to cluster and find patients that are, are fairly similar and where you could start to make some determinations about what you think will happen. And again, that's not to say that we're putting things out there and saying to either a payer or a provider that what our tool says is the absolute truth. 
But it's something where if we could say, well, if, if both parties agree that this is right for the child, great. And maybe we reserve that more intensive reporting and review process that occurs pretty much for every patient today between paired priors. Reserve that for the ones where we really do need to look a little bit more closely. There is some disagreement in what's appropriate. And the tool says this, but one party or the other is saying, no, that doesn't sound right to me because we are looking at other variables outside of what our data looks at. So, um, so yeah, I mean, again, we're looking to inform decision making. We're not looking to take over decision making or put control in the hands of of, of AI. And so, I think that's that's an, a, an important distinction there. I think I think it probably puts the flags in the right place to say, you know, this is an outlier. Let's talk about the outliers. Let's let everything that's not an outlier continue through the path without barriers being put down that affect the child's access to care. So I, I like that idea. Uh, Dave, I do want to go back to your your concept that, that you, had, you had mentioned about proteins. But I mean, my, my first thought in this whole process when you're talking about that is we've been trying to create a system of behavioral health and medical health that somehow communicates that. Is there is there any future sort of guidance to say you know we have a whole variety of our of our clients right now that are receiving psychotropic medication or that have some form of um, a medical uh, comorbidity that that's affecting the way that they're interacting with their community and we need more information on this and the doctors benefit from our data going back to them. Is there any decision making that could, and, and I'm hoping like future, that could be occurring to be a better guide that that transition between behavioral health and medical? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I think some of the re really interesting interdisciplinary interactions with AI, AI have come at that intersection of multiple fields pooling their data together. Uh, precision medicine is a, a great example where I bring in like genetics, pharmacology data, stuff about you know my diagnoses, assessments, all that to come together to create that individualized treatment program. Um, I see no reason why that that wouldn't work for ABA and ASD also. And then I think what's also fun about, about that kind of a future product is it's not just about the insight, but AI is also really good at then generating a report that varies based on the audience I want to communicate to. So someone doesn't have to think of how to tell the physician. We know probably how that physician is going to like it. We can just automate sending it to them and the same report to the parent in a way that that's understandable and, and easy to, to digest for them. Um, so you kind of get both ends, the discovery plus rapid dissemination and communication within the system. Um, be very impactful, be incredible. Yeah. Well, I'm not gonna hold you to that one, but I am gonna <laughs> yeah, appreciate the efforts that you guys have put yeah. in to be able to start the guidance on looking at this larger data set and to be able to take artificial intelligence to be able to help us guide the initial thoughts of our case conceptualization, um, because I think that that's going to guide the field in, in the right direction because we are data driven. So I appreciate what you all have done. Do you have any resources that can either educate on what you're building right now or that could that you could offer families to help them understand what this what AI might be providing for their child or for their own education of what's occurring. Jamie, is there something that Rethink is is doing to be able to provide additional resources on this? All right, well, I might defer to David there. I know he just uh, helped put together a paper that uh, that that we've we've uh, set out into the wild talking about some of the initial work that we've done with our, data set to develop this AI system and start to derive insights about that. Um, and I know we're going to be putting out many, many more articles and, and papers, uh, you know, on this topic over the next several months and, and probably for the foreseeable future. So, uh, but David, I don't know if you have any specific re uh, recommendations or things to refer folks to. Yeah. So we did, um, as part of that white paper, we created several different versions. Um, one of those was a shorter, I think like three page, four page version that's supposed to be an easier read. Um, that one can be found at the Rethink website. So that might be one that people could check out. Um, and then interestingly enough, UNICEF actually published this thing called AI Guide for Parents. Um, that just kind of basic uh, primer, what is AI? How, how can it be used to help um, improve the well-being of, of kids around the world? Um, that might be something people can check out if they're interested in artificial intelligence and just kind of understanding what is this and, and what does it look like. 
And is there anything that that you all are doing to be able to help train clinicians? Because I would imagine this is going to create a lot of buzz. People are going to be excited to have a tool like this. But like any tool, you have to be able to use it appropriately or else it loses its value. And those actionable items that you were talking about, Jamie, seem to disappear because you don't know how to use the tool. Is there, are you all offering trainings through Rethink on for clinicians to be able to utilize it in the right way from the beginning so that the value is enhanced? Well, I think, you know, first of all, look out for, for David and other members of our team who are going to be out on the conference circuit in the next year and, and talking about a lot of the amazing work that they're doing. Um, and I think part of the way that, that I look at it as a, as a product company, um, you know, training and talking about it is one thing the more that we can embed this technology in sort of very practical and useful ways and have it um, be accessible to clinicians in in real time as they're working with clients, making decisions about treatment plans. That's really my goal so that we make it as easy as possible for as many people as possible to benefit from the technology. Well, I'm excited, uh, and I know that I'll actually be at some of those conferences, so hopefully I'll get to see you out there, David. Um, I won't be heckling. I'll be applauding. uh, uh, (laughs) Appreciate that. In the the meantime, I do appreciate the fact that you all came on to be able to talk about this, because I think that it's going to be a game changer for the field, and I think it's something we need to think about as as an ABA industry to be able to realize how do you use this in the best possible way? How do you make sure that you're training the clinicians not to default, but to use it as a tool going forward and to be able to kind of understand the power that it could have when we're doing it correctly? So thank you both for coming on. And uh, I look forward to in one year seeing where this is advanced to. Yeah, thanks for having us, Jeff. I really appreciate being here. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Always a pleasure. Thank you for listening to Autism Weekly. We hope you tune back in next week to learn more about autism in the real world. Autism Weekly is now found on all the major listening apps, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon Music, and more. Subscribe to be notified when we post a new podcast. Autism Weekly is produced by ABS Kids. ABS Kids is proud to provide diagnostic assessments and ABA therapy to children with developmental delays like autism spectrum disorder. You can learn more about ABS Kids and the Autism Weekly Podcast by visiting abskids.com. Thanks for tuning in. See you again next week.